welcome to the uh, first distinguished lecture of 2024. So we are very lucky to have Colin Raffel as our speaker today. So Colin is an associate professor at the University of Toronto and an associate research director at the Vector Institute. His research interests include machine learning algorithms that require little or no labeled data in order to perform a task and systems for collaborative and continual development of machine learning models. So Colin received his PhD in electrical engineering from Columbia University in, uh, in 2016 and masters in music from Stanford University in 2010. And today he's going to tell us about building an ecosystem, not a monolith. <laughs> Great, thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you about this. It's the kind of one of the main research directions we're undertaking in my group. Um, I gave this talk for the first time uh, in August. And when I gave it for the first time, it was a little more speculative. Now we've actually done some of the work. So I'll actually be talking about uh, some very new work. And so if you've seen me talk before, I can guarantee you there's stuff in here you don't know about because it's not on archive yet. And I haven't mentioned it publicly yet. Uh, so, so you'll learn, everyone will learn something new. Uh, but the main goal of this talk is to make an argument that the way that we build kind of like general purpose AI systems, like large language models, is inefficient, if not misguided, and that I'm going to try to argue for a new mode of development that I think has some meaningful benefits. So let's get started. Oh, and by the way, I all since there's a mix of in-person and Zoom people, I think I'll probably just plan to take questions at the end, and I'll make sure to leave a good amount of time for questions. Okay, let me get this out of the way. Um, so until relatively recently, this slide gives you a diagram of kind of how people would build uh, systems that could perform tasks with computers, right? This was kind of the dominant paradigm, let's say five or so years ago. In this paradigm, we'd start with a pre-trained model. A pre-trained model just means a model that we've trained initially on some task, usually a task with lots and lots of data, maybe supervised, maybe not. And then if we want to specialize the model to get it to be much better or just able to perform some particular task, we take that pre-trained model and we fine tune it on a specific data set that represents that task. And then what do we get out? A specialized model that can perform some particular task, hopefully quite well. And so here I'm showing the pre-trained model is this kind of rainbow model in the middle that's then getting adapted to these different colorful models that can do things like summarize articles, uh, do uh, judge paraphrasing and so on. And this transfer learning paradigm, this pre-trained and fine-tuning paradigm was really the standard approach in many application areas of machine learning uh, because it allows the model to converge typically more quickly with less labeled data to a better solution. So it's kind of a triple win and it's just kind of what people did until recently. Uh, and, and recently, arguably, there's a new paradigm that people are pushing where rather than taking a pre-trained model and specializing it to specific tasks, we hope that the pre-trained model is reasonably competent at performing basically any task we throw at it. Um, and so we, we're hoping for what I would call like a general purpose AI system, a system that I can describe what I want the model to do, usually in natural language, and then give the model some data to analyze or not. And then the model does a competent job doing what I ask. And so through a, a very specific recipe that works uh, quite well in this setting, you know, training typically like a transformer language model that's with many parameters on lots of data, we can get really nice uh, behavior that, in other words, models that can perform lots of tasks reasonably competently. Uh, and this is really nice because it doesn't involve the creation of a task specific data set. It doesn't involve any training. We just have one model and we kind of hope or assume that it can do basically everything. So when we build models in this way, as a cartoon, in terms of making the model better, this is kind of the mode of development where we have a model, maybe it works reasonably well, but we find out it doesn't work on some tasks or it performs relatively poorly on some tasks, it lacks some capabilities. So what do we usually do to make the model better? Usually we throw it out and we train a bigger model on more data. And this is a caricature, right? Because people actually do do additional training and other interventions to make the model you know, better at following instructions or whatever. But 
as a caricature, this is, I think, reasonably accurate. You know, you can think of series of models from GPT-1, 2 to 3 to 4, or pick your favorite model series. Uh, this is what we've done, right? We want a big jump in capability, so we throw out the old thing and we build something new that's bigger and hopefully significantly better. So in this talk, I'm going to make an argument for another paradigm that I think could be an effective way for building general purpose AI systems. So in other words, we're going to take the large language model that was uh, on the screen a couple slides ago, and we're going to replace it with a new box. And what's for the moment, what's inside the box doesn't matter. We hope that the system as a whole works the same. I describe to the system what I want the system to do, and it does a reasonably competent job at performing whatever task I ask it to. And of course, the important thing is, what do we put in the box? Before the box was a giant transformer language model, now it's gonna be something different. So what is it? What would I call it? And I'm gonna call it an ecosystem of models. And what do I mean by that? I mean that it's gonna be a collection of specialized models. So each of the models in this collection will be very effective, quite competent at some narrow task or domain. So not at everything, you couldn't ask it to do every possible task, it's good at one particular task. And we will gather a collection of these specialized models. How big should the collection be? I'm not sure, but let's say tens of thousands of models, if not more, many, many, many models specialized to all kinds of different tasks. And now the question is, how can I treat this big collection of models like a general purpose AI system? And I'm gonna argue for uh, needing a couple of kind of innovations that will make this really work. The first is the ability to pick which model I should use for a given query. So if I ask the model, you know, I'm having my gluten-free mom and vegan sister over for dinner, can you suggest an easy recipe? I need to find a model or models, and I'll get to that in a moment, that can perform this task competently. Maybe I'm really lucky and maybe I have a recipe creation model. Then I just need an automatic way to find the recipe creation model. Because if I have 10,000 models, I don't want the user to have to uh, click a drop down and select the recipe creation model. I just want to pick it automatically. Because again, I'm, I'm trying to replace the, the original monolithic large language model with another box. So I don't want the user interaction to change at all. The other thing we need is that let's say we don't have a recipe creation model. Then I'm going to argue that we need, or we hopefully can develop methods that can compose capabilities across models. So let's say I want to summarize a document in the style of Shakespeare. I don't want a Shakespeare summarization model. I want a summarization model and a Shakespeare generation model. And I want to combine those models rapidly and cheaply with no training so that I can do Shakespeare summarization, okay? So I'm gonna be talking, first in this talk, I'll try to lay out the argument for why I think this is a good idea. And then I'll talk about those technical challenges in a little more detail. But to give you a a, an initial flavor of why this might be a good idea, unlike the development of monolithic models, where when we want an improvement of capabilities, usually we throw out the old model and big and build a new one. If we build an ecosystem in this way, we might hope that the capabilities of the ecosystem as a whole grow gradually over time as we add more models to the collection. And in particular, adding or removing or updating the models in the collection can be done in a decentralized way. So we don't require a ton of compute upfront and some entity that has access to a ton of compute to train a model. We just rely on lots of people or maybe even just small compute jobs, training models and sharing them into this big ecosystem and making the ecosystem better, hopefully better and better over time. Okay, so again, specifically in this talk, I'm gonna try to answer this question, how and why should we build an ecosystem of specialized models instead of monolithic uh, general purpose systems? And so first I'll talk, I'll actually first talk a bit about why and then a little more about how. So for one answer to the why question, I'm gonna briefly just try to convince you or remind you that specialist models are often better, they work better, they're more performant, and they're more efficient, they're cheaper than monolithic models. And this is one of those things that I think everyone knows, but no one talks about because it's very unsexy to talk about. Uh, but let us let me just give you a reminder or, or explain why I think this is true if you're not familiar. So first, I'm going to give an example from a paper from my group uh, from uh, not this NeurIPS in December, but the NeurIPS before. So it's, it's a hopelessly out of date paper, embarrassingly out of date, but I'm going to present it anyways because I think it really makes the point in a compelling way. And you have to transport your, bat, your, your, your mind back in time to ancient history when GPT-3 was the most performant monolithic large language model that we had. 
Okay, so forget this pre chat GPT, pre GPT uh, four before Claude, uh, Gemini, etc. Olden days, right? And at the time, we wanted to make this exact argument that specialist models could be efficient and more performant than uh, than than GPT three specifically, the state of the art generalist monolithic model. And so what we did is we built a recipe for taking a pre-trained model and fine tuning it on a small labeled data set, like in this case, let's say 32 examples and rapidly getting a fine tuned model specialized to that task. And then given that specialized model, the question then becomes how much more, how much, how does, how well does it work compared to GPT-3 using few shot in context learning, which is where you take the data set and you concatenate all the examples in and just feed it into the model, whatever you wanna make a prediction. So how does it work? How well does it work compared to that? And how much faster is it? If you fine tune them all, you don't need to feed in the full data set. You just feed in one example at a time. So you get a win there. And also the model itself is quite a lot smaller. So what we end, ultimately ended up finding was that the, the specialist models that we created using this recipe we're about a thousand times faster per inference example than GPT-3 using Fuchsia and context learning. So it's a thousand times faster and it works better. The performance was better, okay? So if I tell you, here's one model, it's a thousand times more expensive and it works worse, or here's another model, it's a thousand times cheaper and works better. Obviously you choose the smaller and more performant model, unless you're really afraid of fine tuning, right? You really don't wanna do gradient descent or, or any, any updates to your model at all. But what if I told you that this fine tuning recipe costs about as much as performing inference on 16 examples with GPT-3. So by the time you've performed inference on 16 examples with GPT-3, you could have a fine-tuned model that's now a thousand times faster and works better, okay? And I'll talk a little bit more about this recipe later, but my, my point is made. And now you might say, okay, that's a very out of date result. You know, now we have these much, much, much better models. But actually, if you dig into some of the papers about these models, you can find examples of the point that I'm trying to make. So here's uh, from the Palm 2 technical report, which I guess now you know wasn't that out of date in August, but now is a little out of date. But in any case, Palm 2, very effective monolithic large language model. And if you look at some of the tables that they have in the paper presenting the performance of Palm 2 compared to other models, like this table on the top, this is the performance on various common sense reasoning benchmarks. And you look closely, you can see that you know mostly they're just trying to say that Palm 2 is state of the art and Palm 2 outperforms GPT-4. But if you look at some of the state-of-the-art results, in particular the two that I'm highlighting with the arrows there, actually those results came from specialist models. These are models that are dramatically, dramatically smaller and cheaper, like fine-tuned models on the scale of like BERT, right? And so, so they're kind of making my point accidentally. And even when we're talking about translation results, Google Translate, we actually don't know exactly what Google Translate is, but I think we can assume reasonably com confidently that uh, Google Translate is much more efficient than Palm 2. Uh, works nearly as well as Palm 2 for translations, okay? So, so again, ho hopefully, hopefully you all know this or at least believe it to some degree so I don't have to convince you, uh, but, but initial point, okay? So specialist models can be cheaper and work better. Now I'm gonna kind of make a, logistical point about building this system. This is optional. This doesn't have to be how the ecosystem is built, but it's just one way to think about how to build it that I think will uh, hopefully uh, convince you that it's, it's, it's plausible to do easily. And, and that is to imagine that each, each specialist model is constructed via a cheaply communicable update to a base model. And in particular, uh, for those of you who are familiar with parameter efficient fine tuning, that's what I'm referring to here. And to give an example of that uh, from the, the paper I mentioned a few slides ago where we were outperforming GPT-3, uh, that recipe for this few shot fine tuning recipe was called TFU and TFU made use of a fine tuning method we called IA3. And what IA3 is, it does is it introduces vectors uh, throughout the model that get multiplied element wise by the model's activations and you only update those vectors. And so because you're not updating the weight matrix that produce the activation, you're just, produ you're just updating a, a vector of the same shape as the activation. The number of parameters that are updated is a lot smaller. So in the case of IA3, we end up updating in the experiment on the right, about 0.01% as many parameters as updating the full model. And, we, and, um, and so if, you, if, I, you know, if I said earlier 10,000 models in my ecosystem and you're like, okay, that would take a lot of storage space if each of these models is a few gigabytes, in, in this case, IA3 takes a few megabytes of disk space for a reasonably large base model. 
more recently, we had a paper where we showed that if you take these parameter efficient updates, like the ones constructed by IE3 or uh, via LoRa, if you're familiar with the low rank adaptation parameter efficient fine tuning method, if you're not, it's fine. Um, you can actually compress them to a significant degree. And in particular, you can represent them as a difference between their initialization and their final value. And then you can make that difference sparse and you can ternarize it, which means that the values are either, they're mostly zero, but sometimes they're negative alpha and sometimes they're alpha. And if you do that, you can compress them to a very significant degree. And ultimately uh, for the, I, the compressed IA3 vectors, they end up being on the order of like tens of kilobytes in storage space. So 10,000 models, sure. I mean, 10,000 models on a single GPU, no problem, right? Tens of kilobytes, so it's not a problem, okay? And I'll mention that because this works really well. And because the uh, sharing these updates is now very cheap, right? Tens of kilobytes, very easy to share of the internet or even megabytes or gigabytes for that matter. Um, the, people do share them a lot. And, uh, and I hear I'm using examples for, um, uh, for language models, but actually for, for image generation models like stable diffusion, this is even more widespread. Um, but if you look on the Hugging Face Model Hub, there are a few thousand models that are created via these parameter vision updates. And there's actually this nice older system that's not used quite as much called Adapter Hub where people share adapters in this way. So people, the point is people are already doing this. They're already taking base models. They're computing parameter vision updates to specialize them and they're sharing them with one another. Okay, so, so we should be able to fill the ecosystem relatively easily. All right, so now I will get into one of the more like how questions which I, that I mentioned earlier, which is that we need to be able to choose the appropriate model for a query automatically, okay? I think this is pretty important. It's not strictly necessary, but, but it's pretty important. So then, then the, the question is how, or, or does this even work? And, and actually, when I, when I first gave this talk in August, I, I had a bunch of slides arguing why I thought this would work, but then in November, there was this nice paper that came out showing that actually it, 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 you can do this and it works pretty well. And what they do in this paper, and it, again, this is not from my group, uh, what they do in this paper is they basically take a pool of language models and they take a bunch of uh, queries for these language models. They feed each query into each language model, get the response, feed each response into a reward model, and then they just train a little classifier to predict which language model would get the highest reward for this query. In other words, which language model is the right one to pick for this task. And then for new data, new queries, they just feed the query into this little classifier. They call it the Zooter. They don't explain why they call it the Zooter in the paper. It turns out it's the router for a zoo. It's a, a zoo router, like a model zoo, okay? Not an ecosystem, a zoo. Okay, so it's the Zooter. They feed the query into the Zooter. If you think this name is funny, just wait, okay? Uh, and the Zooter picks which language model to use, and they feed the query into the language model. And the, this aggregate pool of language models works better than any of the individual models because you're kind of picking the optimal model for the task. And actually there are a few products that have come out uh, that, that do a similar thing to this uh, sense that I don't have any examples in the talk, but I can, I can dig them up if anyone's interested. So this works, it, it totally, totally works. Um, we actually have been working on something for a while in my group that is uh, similar in spirit to this, but, but, uh, but notably different, a little more related to what I'm talking about in the talk. And in particular, if anyone has been listening to me talking about all this and thinking, this sounds kind of like mixture of expert style models, then now I'm gonna kind of address that thought that you have. Uh, and in particular, if you imagine that we have a base model, and again, we create all these little adapters of that base model to specialize it, and we need to pick which one to use, okay, that kind of sounds like the experts in a mixture of experts model and picking which one to use sounds like the router. It's a little different because we're not doing this during pre-training, right? We're, we're not just constructing experts randomly and you know training them during uh, pre-training. And, 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 and if you train a typical MOE style model like Mixtral or as people say GPT-4 is, you're, you're not intentionally specializing any of the experts. Any expert specialization kind of happens by accident. Uh, here, I'm actually describing the case where, again, we have intentionally specialized models. So, but in any case, let's say we have a big pool of adapters. The question then becomes, how can I post hoc pick which adapter to use at a given layer? Because again, usually these adapters are inserted throughout the layers of the model. So at a given layer, how do I pick which adapter I should use? Now, the challenging thing is simply, how do I construct the router? It turns out to be challenging to do, especially when you don't assume you have access to the data that the 
little experts, the adapters were trained on. And you wanna be able to continually expand the router. So when someone adds a new adapter to your adapter ecosystem, your pool of models, I wanna be able to expand my router to route things to that adapter without uh, any, um, without, without the model's performance degrading on, on the other tasks. And again, I want this to work in the zero shot setting. So all of those things make this really challenging, but we have something that, that works really well uh, or works reasonably well that we call post hoc adaptive tokenwise gating over an ocean of specialized experts or fat goose with a PH. <laughs> and, uh, and the way that it works is that if someone trains an adapter, we ask them to do a little bit of extra work. And the extra work is, okay, once you're done training your adapter on your data, freeze the adapter and freeze the rest of the model. And now train a little binary gate or little sigmoidal gate it just has a vector that gets multiplied element wise by each of the, or excuse me, that we compute a dot product of that vector with, uh, with each of the activations uh, for the sequence of activations that's being fed into that adapter. We feed those dot products into a, a sigmoid nonlinearity, multiply it element wise by the vector. So we're kind of gating which, which of these activations do we actually want to send into the adapter. And what that does is it gives us a little vector that kind of tells us what kinds of things we should feed in to this expert, to this adapter, okay? And then if we concatenate, whoops, if we concatenate these vectors, we end up with a router, right? So we just compute the dot product of each token's activation with these vectors that we, com we uh, computed during this kind of post hoc training step. And then for each token position at each layer, we can make an adaptive routing decision. So we're not making a full model routing. We're not picking which entire model we wanna to send to, but for each token, each layer, we can make a different decision. And so if you measure how well this works in terms of zero shot generalization performance, uh, we, in, in this case, we, uh, we considered the setting from the T0 paper for those of you who are familiar. If you're not, it's fine. It's not terribly important. But if we compare the com performance of using fat goose with various other methods for constructing a multitask model, some of which do kind of like a, a post hoc routing or a combination of experts, uh, one of which is just simply training a multitask model. So taking all the data that was used to train all the experts and just training the model, fine tuning the model and all of that data. FACUS actually works better than all of those methods, including multitask training in this setting, which I think is quite cool because this is decentralized uh, and, and, uh, and relatively cheap. And it almost performs as well as what would have happened if you had just picked the best, best expert for each zero shot data set, okay? Uh, it doesn't work quite as well in some other challenging settings, but we'll get the preprint on archive soon and you can judge it for yourself. Okay, so now this actually is kind of the biggest chunk of my talk because I think this requires the biggest conceptual leap. Namely, I'm gonna talk about that issue I mentioned earlier, what happens if we don't actually have an appropriate uh, specialized model for the task that the user is requesting, okay? And actually this slide I just presented from the Fat Goose paper has to do with zero shot generalization. So it actually does, that actually works reasonably well, but I think we're gonna have to do some other stuff. And, and now I'm gonna describe what that other stuff is. Uh, and so, so let me kind of present you with a conceptual framework about how to think about what, I, what I'm getting at, what I, what I think we're gonna need. Um, and in particular, I want you to think with me of tasks as the composition of skills. And this is not a rigorous framework. There is no correct way to do this. It's just a conceptual framework, just a way of think about things. And I think many people think about things this way, but I just wanna mention this now before I dive into uh, the, the description of, of what we're gonna to wanna to do. So in particular, if you think of a query, like how long will it take for a penny to hit the ground from the top of the Empire State Building? You can think of the, the ability to respond to that query correctly as a combination, combination of skills. What those skills are, totally up for interpretation, but you could imagine, for example, in this case, it requires some world knowledge, like how tall is the Empire State Building? Uh, how heavy is a penny? Physical reasoning, you know, how does gravity work? And also some arithmetic. So plugging in those numbers that you got and getting an answer. And each of these skills themselves you can think of kind of queries that only re respect that specific skill. Like for arithmetic, like what is 10 times 12 plus three? That really arguably only tests arithmetic. Um, but, but many queries require a composition of skills. So we have lots of models that are specialized to one particular skill, 
or to some set of skills? How do we grab some skills from some models and some skills from other models and get an aggregate model that can perform tasks that re require a composition of those skills? The main way that I'm gonna argue or hope that we can do this is via what people call merging methods. Merging is something we've been working on in my group for a while. And the basic idea with merging is that if I want to specialize a model to some particular task, uh, uh, I don't necessarily want to just perform additional training. I might want to combine models to get it to be able to perform that task or to get it to improve performance on that task. So on the top, I'm showing what kind of happens during standard sequential training. You know, we take some additional data, uh, we train on that data. Maybe if we want to do really well on a target task, we do what's called intermediate task training, where we first train on a donor task and then on a target task. But if we can merge models, then maybe we can separately train on the donor and target task and then merge those models together, combine them without doing any additional training and improve performance on the target task. Or maybe we can do kind of unusual esoteric things like I'm showing on the bottom, uh, your right, bottom right of the screen. So what, what is merging? How, how do we actually perform merging? Well, one way, uh, and this is from some work from actually from a while ago, uh, but, uh, but I think it provides a nice, one nice way to think about what merging should do is to solve this optimization problem, which is basically finding a set of parameter values that has a high probability under the posterior distribution of the individual models that we're merging, okay? So uh, in particular, we're optimizing over this shared theta, a sum of the log posterior distributions multiplied by this hyperparameter lambda sub i, which just can, you can use to uh, in, you know, kind of intuitively set a different model's weight. But if, if you are suspicious about that, you can just assume that lambda sub i is one for all models, okay? And so it turns out that if you make the Laplace approximation, which is a way of approximating the model's posterior distribution, specifically if you assume the posterior is distributed according to a normal, uh, with a, uh, in, and in this first case, I'll, I'll say a normal with an uh, identity covariance matrix, then the solution to this optimization problem is actually just taking a weighted average of the model's parameters uh, by the, uh, where the weighting is determined by these hyper, these lambda sub i hyperparameters. And this actually is what a lot of people do. If I want to merge two models, I just average them. I just compute their average. This is remarkably common. Uh, in, in this work that I'm talking about now, we actually showed that if you make a, a a better approximation of the posterior via the Laplace approximation where you use the diagonal fissure as the precision matrix, then it works a little better and also has a closed form solution. The closed form solution here being uh, you're doing a weighted average where you also have a weighting over the uh, parameter values and the weighting is determined by the, the diagonal fissure. The diagonal fissure kind of captures the sensitivity of the model's output to uh, the parameters uh, value. And so if the models, if one particular model is sensitive to some particular parameter, then you kind of upweight that in the weighted average, okay? But in any case, if we perform Fisher merging, the method I just described, it lets us do stuff like I described earlier. Uh, and in particular, if we uh, do this kind of standard intermediate task training setup with uh, BERT and first fine tune on MNLI and then RTE, which are two tasks that happen to work really well in the intermediate task setting, we can get further boosts by merging that model with a donor task model trained on a different data set. Okay, so on this bar chart, the dashed line is the original RTE performance. If we merge it with different donor tasks, we get a boost in performance. And this is, this is an older paper. People are doing much wilder things with merging now. I'll talk about uh, some of that stuff a little later. Um, but first, let me mention a more recent paper where uh, we showed that many merging methods that people use uh, can be viewed as solving a linear system of equations, kind of this like per layer linear system, including diagonal Fisher merging, which I just mentioned. If you use this linear system kind of perspective, then it turns out you can solve, you can perform merging in cases where there is no closed form solution for that optimization problem I had on the screen, okay? And in particular, if you can express the merging problem as a linear system that needs to be solved, you can use the conjugate gradient method and solve it. And so that allows us to do things like use a blockwise Fisher approximation. So basically, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with KFAC, it's kind of like that. Basically, for each layer, we have a, a block along the diagonal of the Fisher matrix. That, um, that approximation has no tractable closed form solution. 
Uh, but with the content created method, we can actually do this. And so interestingly, if we do merging via the content gradient method, now we need to describe, uh, now we need to decide what the initialization is and what the objective, what the linear system is that we want to solve. And you can see that for different pre-existing merging methods, we can get a different amount of a performance boost from using different objectives. Um, I won't go into a lot more detail here, except to say that you know this uh, this works quite well. Now, from a completely different perspective, uh, one thing that people have shown to work well in, in terms of merging is to compute task vectors. And I, I briefly mentioned something like task vectors earlier, where you take the fine-tuned model parameters and you subtract the initialization from those fine-tuned parameters. That's we call a task vector. And in this work, we showed that if you merge task vectors by adding them together, you can get what we call interference, where basically for one model, one of the parameters changed in one direction. For another model, it changed in the other direction. So if you add those two things together, you get no change at all. And that actually is suboptimal for both of the models, for both of the tasks. So if you resolve into interference between the task vectors before you merge them, you can get a big performance boost. And the exciting thing, I think, in this case is that uh, we showed that if you take two individual task models and you merge them to get a multitask model, then as long as the number of tasks is relatively modest, you can get very little performance degradation in the merged multitask model, okay? So this is good. It means I can construct multitask models out of individual task models. This will be important if I have a query that requires kind of like multiple tasks to solve. Okay, so that's that's kind of the typical way that we think of merging, kind of combining the parameter values in, in various ways. There are other ways people have done merging uh, or things that look like merging that I just want to mention here because in particular, it, it looks a lot more like composing skills. So one uh, task that I think very obviously requires multiple skills is to perform a task in some specific language, right? If I want to do question answering in French, the model needs to be able to understand French and answer questions. Those, I think, arguably, I think you can all agree, are kind of distinct skills. You can, you can understand French without knowing how to answer questions. You can answer questions without understanding French. So in order to enable cross-lingual generalization, in other words, the ability to perform a task that the model can perform, but in a new language, what this paper does is they train parameters that are specialized to specific languages or tasks, and then they compose those parameters. In this case, uh, these are prompt tuning uh, parameters. They're fed into the input of the model by just concatenating different combinations of those prompts. And it works reasonably well for cross-lingual generalization. Another nice paper that uh, really fundamentally cap, uh, attacks this question of kind of like latent skills uh, is this, uh, this paper, um, composing modular skills uh, for multitask learning, where they actually have a kind of a bank of adapters that can be used to perform a specific task. And what they do is they learn a binary skill, so an adapter skill, to task assignment matrix that decides which of those adapters to combine together to perform some particular skill, uh, some particular task. And, and this turns out to work even better than multitask learning. So this is, this is a nice paper if you want to look it up. Now, just to give you one other example of what some of the things people are doing with merging, here's again, something that I think is pretty clearly uh, can be decomposed into individual skills, specifically building a multimodal model, a model that has a shared embedding space of text and images. So it turns out that if you train a text model, let's say a transformer-based text model, and you train a vision model with a transformer that has exactly the same architecture as the text model, and you merge them, you average their parameters or combine them in one way or another, you can get a reasonably competent multimodal model. Okay. So again, I think most of us would think of the ability to embed images and the ability to embed text as disjoint skills. Uh, but it turns out that merging can provide a way of composing those skills. And so in my group, we are actively working on characterizing the settings where merging can compose skills and the settings where it can't and trying to address those shortcomings, uh, because I think this is one promising way of doing this skill composition for uh, improving generalization in, in this ecosystem setting. I will also mention, and, and I, 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 I'm starting to think I don't necessarily need 
to include this mention in my talk anymore because merging is just becoming so widespread in the open model community. In fact, I saw my first meme about merging just before this talk this morning. And once something is memed, it's probably a pretty widespread knowledge. Um, but merging is incredibly common in the open model community. Again, this, this merging that is being done is almost always simple parameter averaging. But what people are doing is they're taking language models that have the same architecture. They're averaging their parameters and measuring performance on uh, you know, general, generalist benchmarks and noting that the performance gets improved and they're coming up with these very sophisticated merging strategies. And here's another case where I will mention that this is even more common again in the uh, text to image community and like the stable diffusion community, where for example, if I have a model that's very good at generating images that look like they're built out of Legos and another model that's very good at generating like steampunk imagery, I, if I want a steampunk Lego model, I just average their parameters and it works remarkably well. It's, it's so common that in the interfaces people use for stable diffusion image generation, there's just like a slider for merging. It's, it's that common. It's really, really widespread. And this, this screenshot that I'm showing, by the way, is from a model that at some point was doing quite well on the various language model leaderboards. And you can see they are describing how they composed various models uh, to get a, uh, this model 30B Lazarus. I don't act, they don't actually explain the syntax and I don't understand it, but I do know that they are combining many models to get an aggregate model that works quite well. And again, this is super, super, super common. And one reason it's common is that if I want a better language model, often I can't I don't have the compute to train it, but the merging operation is incredibly cheap. I'm just averaging parameters. It's like less, it's basically as expensive as a single forward pass for a single token. So people, hobbyists are doing this all over the place. Okay, and then the last little note that I'll make, just to mention some additional work that we've, we've done, is that I think in order to orchestrate and build this ecosystem, we're gonna need to build some systems. And we've done some systems building in my group. So let me mention some of the projects that I think are, are relevant here. The first is a project that we had at ICML last year called Git Theta. And the idea with Git Theta is that if we are orchestrating the open development of lots of models and the development of these models might involve someone taking a model and performing some additional training or updating, maybe combining models by merging them, then we need a way to track that development. And this feels a lot like the tracking the development of open source software, right? Because there are many open source software libraries out there. If I wanna create a new piece of software, I might grab some of those libraries and compose them to combine their skills, so to speak. And I might take one of those libraries and improve it in some way and make my fork, merge the fork back in, et cetera, et cetera. So the goal of this project was to, as literally as possible, map those ideas from open source software development onto model development. And so literally that the ultimate product of this research was a extension to Git that allows continual and collaborative tracking of machine learning model checkpoints called Git Theta. And so what Git Theta does, if you, um, the first thing you can do is just say Git Theta track model.pt, track the checkpoint, commit it, just like, and after you do this initial Git Theta command, everything else is just a standard git command. Uh, you can run your fine tuning script, commit that, check out a new branch, fine tune on that branch, commit that, check out the main branch, do some fine tuning on the main branch, and then merge the RTE branch. So now we're merging the two branches together, the, the gray lines on the figure over there. And Git Theta actually has a merge menu that comes up. It says, do you wanna just average the model's parameters together? Do you wanna take some parameters and not the other and so on? And you can also do weird things like if you want to delete some of the parameters from the model, it can track that too. Okay. And it does this all in a standard Git repo. And as long as your remote supports Git LFS, which GitHub does, Hugging Face Model Hub does, uh, GitLab, I think, does, then it supports Git Theta. Okay. So the big question, there's kind of two questions that come up here. The big question is, what's the advantage of doing this over just using Git LFS, which is a way of tracking large files with Git, to track the, the model checkpoint as a blob of data, just like a, any other blob of data? The, the, one of the big advantages is saving communication and storage costs. Because if I do parameter efficient updating to my model, I don't want to store the entire new checkpoint. Um, I just want to store the parameter efficient update. So Git Theta does that. It also does some compression on its own to save storage space, but 
it's uh, only a modest amount. But then if you do something like if I take a checkpoint, a PyTorch checkpoint, and I delete some of the parameters, then Git LFS treats it as an entirely new file object. But actually, all I need to do is track which parameters I deleted. And so I save a ton of space if I do that too. And also, you know, it, it actually works. So if you do the thing that I mentioned earlier, then the performance tends to go up on the tasks that we were, you know, fine tuning the base model on. Okay. The other system we built, which was actually built a while ago, but was just published at NeurIPS last year, is called Petals. And the problem that Petals tackles is that if we have a model, if one of our specialist models or uh, any of our specialist models are too big for one person to run, or they just have their phone or their laptop, so they can't really run a, a big model, they don't really have a lot of compute, then how do you make it so that people can still use these models? And what Petals does is it allows volunteers to basically say, I'm willing to run inference for this subset of layers in the model, for you know layers four to six of the model. And they announce this to Petals. The, the Petals is like a system that's running somewhere. They announce it to Petals. And then if a user comes along and says, I want to perform, I want the, the, the aggregate model to perform this query, then Petals decides which peers to use and tells them where to send their activations. And then under the hood, there's some compression of the activations happening and also compression of the models to make things run fast. And what ultimately happens, and, and this is actually true right now, uh, are that people can announce that they can run parts of a model and you can look at this URL to see which models are being uh, hosted right now. But it means that anyone can come along and just say, hey, I want to run this query and Petals will route the query and the activations through the volunteers to get the response uh, uh, to that query from that model, okay? So that's all that I'm gonna share right now. Um, I'm happy to take questions, but I'll first quickly say that whenever I give a talk, I always uh, ask for feedback. So if you thought I talked too quickly or too slowly, too much detail, not enough detail, uh, you can, and you want to submit feedback anonymously, you can do it at that form. But also if you just have questions or comments that you want to talk to me about non-anonymously, you can just email me. Um, so thanks, thanks a lot. And, and I'm happy to take questions over Zoom uh, or in person, and I'll try to remember to repeat uh, in-person questions so Zoom people can hear them. Yeah. Right, right. Because people are kind of just picking the best merge that kind of works. And so I think here there's this kind of underlying thing where the benchmarks for tasks are more, they're not like that what we care about from the model is that it's good at this task. Yeah. But more so that the fact that it's able to be good at this task without necessarily being explicitly trained for it might indicate that it might be good for many other tasks yeah. that it also was not trained for. Yeah, yeah. And so I wonder kind of this distinction of is the fact that we're choosing a bunch of models that are good at specific tasks like can we really make this kind of claim that any problem that we want is really a composition of tasks yeah per se or like yeah something underlying yeah i think you're kind of getting at three three-ish things and i'll see if i can remember them oh uh and i should repeat the question the question is basically like uh, doing this require, requires re being able to evaluate things in a reasonably comp confident way, but like we can't really do that. And in particular, would you worry about kind of like overfitting to specific tasks and not generalizing to new tasks, so to speak? Yeah. So, so I think there's a couple of things. The first is like the, the just that evaluating the zero shot generalization capabilities of models is incredibly challenging. In particular, particular because if it's really zero shot, then you should never be able to see the same data twice, right? And how many times have we now exposed models to the data from the Hugging Face leaderboard? I mean, yeah, so I, I, I absolutely agree with that point. The, the, I, I do want to make one point, though, which is that from the perspective of an end user, if they ask an, uh, their the system to perform a task, and the model performs the task competently, the user actually doesn't care whether the model was exposed to the, that task before or not. They just want the model to work. 
So if our ecosystem had 10 billion models in it and it covered basically anything that anyone wants to do with their, that we won, we're done, right? That being said, I don't actually, I mean, if you really think about if you, and again, I think you can trust the conceptual framework without um, necessarily believing that it's, uh, ac uh, uh, it, it could exist in the real world. Um, we wouldn't necessarily have a model for every composition of skills. And so we do actually care about zero shot generalization. And so, you know, how to actually rigorously evaluate that. I mean, that's a challenge for language models in general. Um, but I do think that we have evidence that, yeah, that merging, for example, can compose skills in models. Uh, the Hugging Face leaderboard is probably a good example of not the right evidence for that, right? Um, but I think, for example, like the fact that you can do vision language model merging and you get a composition uh, is, is is compelling evidence in that case. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. I'm rambling a little bit, but yeah. I guess, and also a bit of a problem is sort of this versus like human. Yeah. So why using models that you originally rather than having a model Definitely. that learns how to use like whole time? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, I, I I think I've gotten this question every time I give the talk, so it's a, which means it's a very good question, and it means that I, I should I should probably should talk about it. But I think like the the way that I think about this is that there is a basically a spectrum, and the spectrum the axes of the spectrum are how competent is the router and how competent are the tools, and in this talk I was mostly implicitly talking about a very weak router, and very powerful tools. GPT-4 using tools is a very powerful router and very weak tools, right? It, incredibly specialized tools, so specialized that they don't actually understand natural language, right? They, they only can, yeah, uh, perform arithmetic, let's say, it's a calculator. And, but this is a spectrum, right? So I'm just, I'm just pushing our, our, us along one axis as far as I can to, to kind of scratch our brains a little bit. Um, but absolutely, yeah, you can, imagine, um, you can imagine interpolating these things and having something that's more effective or performant. Um, I saw it on Zoom, Mirad. I saw you raise your, I think you raised your hand first there. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Hi, Colleen. Thanks a lot for the interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I have a quick question about the part where you were talking about like how uh, like few shot uh, parameter fine tuning is better and cheaper than in context learning. So I kind of get the idea uh, why you would perform better, but I'm a little bit confused on the cheaper part. Like how would you, uh, how would you say this when we should consider like the amount of effort and time we should put in generating the uh, like the training data for it? So yeah. if you can elaborate on that, that would be great. Yeah, so that paper was making a very specific comparison between few shot uh, fine tuning and few shot in context learning. And few shot in context learning, increasingly people are doing less of, but this is this thing where you actually do construct a data set and you concatenate the examples from that data set, and then you ask the model, and you feed it into the model, then you ask the model to do inference on a new example. Okay, and, and ideally we shouldn't have to do that. Ideally we should do everything zero shot. So we just tell the model what we want it to do, and then we have the model do it. But, but at the time, and this is still true to a significant degree, people do provide examples of what the model should do. In doing so, they create a data set. And then the question is, what should you do with that data set? Should you do few shot in context learning with a large model that can do few shot on context learning well, or should you fine tune a model? And the argument that we were making in that paper was that if you use the same exact data set with the same number of examples as you would put in context to fine tune a model, then you get a model that works better and is, is faster. I see. So you're saying the in, top, in the in context learning model is actually not a zero shot, but a, uh, but a model that has been trained few shot? So that's the thing is that. Uh, um, it's, it is not zero shot because it is using a data set, but it's not trained, at least in the way that we usually train models, right? So we are, in both cases, we are constructing a data set with, let's say, 32 examples. We're just using it in different ways. In one case, we're using it to perform gradient descent. In another case, we're using it to feed it as context to the model so that hopefully it performs inference better. Um, and the, 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 one of the conceptual leaps that I want everyone to be able to make is that at the end of the day, if you are like, you're making a data set either way. So the question is, what are you gonna do with it? Um, I think people are people are very excited about few shot context learning because it doesn't involve gradient descent and that's kind of interesting. But at the end of the day, from a user's perspective, what matters is that they created the data set, right? Hopefully that answers your question, yeah. Thank you.
Uh, maybe I'll take another question from Zoom, uh, Lunjin. Yeah. Hi, Colin. Um, I also asked the question in the Zoom chat. Uh, I guess my question is, most of the merging tasks you showed here seem to be merging models that are already past the point of emergent capabilities. In the sense that to get the initial emergent capability, you still have to have a sufficient large enough model, train enough data for this ability to, to emerge in the first place. And then perhaps you can merge them together. And so if that's the case, first of all, like, do you agree with that or did I misunderstand something? And I guess secondly, if that's the case, do you think this type of merging technique will always be capped by emergence um, to some extent? Yeah, so I think it, I, I think the answer is yes and no, because I think it depends on, like, if we presuppose that uh, emergence happens and uh, the question then becomes, why? Why is it happening? And one reason, and, and you can think of various reasons why. One reason is that um, only a model of sufficient scale can express the algorithm that is required to solve this task, right? We don't, we can't actually rigorously connect like the number of layers in a model or the number of parameters in a model to a model's ability to perform like n digit arithmetic. We, I, I don't believe that's, we are able to do that. Uh, but you can at least uh, conceptually think about the model's ability to perform more complex algorithms as being a function of its scale. And so, yes, for certain, in certain cases, uh, you need a model of a certain scale to do something. But I, I think it, I think that's not, or, or you can think about like uh, internalizing knowledge. You know, we have to compress the knowledge somewhere. So we need more parameters to do that. Um, on the other hand, some of these emergent behaviors might actually come from the model's ability to chain, sort of like chain different uh, smaller steps, smaller algorithms. And I think this is actually how a lot of people think now about what these models are actually doing and why why they work. There was this paper, Faith and Fate, The Limits of Transformers on Compositionality, that kind of argues that like what transformers are learning are these little sub algorithms and they're constructing these computational graphs, but a model of a certain scale can only uh, construct a computational graph of a certain depth and width. I think that's, maybe I'm getting it off a little bit, but I think that was the basic idea. And are there are other, other papers, uh, I can point to another paper by Sanji Varora that was that was arguing that some of these capabilities and this emergence comes from the ability to compose skills. So if emergence comes from composing simple skills, simple small little algorithmic steps, and we have models that can perform those skills and we have a compose operation that actually works, which merging kind of works, I don't think it works as well as we want it to, then maybe we can still get emergence from the system. Um, I, I don't know, but, it, but I, I think it's interesting to try. Thank you. And thank yeah. you for the great talk. Thanks, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Professor Raffle. How do you feel about um, training specialized models with auto parameters, I mean, fine tuning them with auto parameters versus the lightweight of lambda expression adapters? So, for example, in video recently, we had a paper where they uh, made a language model for chip design, uh, but they essentially found that training auto parameters was better performance. So, they just said we're not going to worry about the LoRa and EMP stuff. So, how would we argue for the longevity of parameter efficient tuning and merging when someone can always argue, you know, we can just train the entire model and go back to that dominant paradigm from five, 10 years ago? Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, again, this is not something that we have a, a, a rigorous notion of, but I, I usually tie the ability to perform parameter efficient fine tuning back to the idea of like the intrinsic dimensionality of a task, which was introduced as an idea to say basically, how many parameters do I need to update to get the model to be able to fit this data set? Yeah. And the way that it was initially measured doesn't really matter, but I think you can think of parameter efficient fine tuning methods as a way of measuring the intrinsic dimensionality of a task. So if you have a task, which I should say, we have no rigorous way to characterize the intrinsic dimensionality of a task. We have a lot of ways to uh, approximate it and produce an upper bound on what the intrinsic dimensionality might be. But if I introduce LoRa, and Laura introduces n parameters, and the intrinsic dimensionality of the task is higher than n. We don't actually know how high it is, except we know that if Laura doesn't work, maybe the intrinsic dimensionality was higher. Uh, then it won't work, and and maybe and and so that that's usually how I characterize things. I also think there's a lot of evidence that the intrinsic dimensionality of a task for a given model decreases as the model gets better zero shot on that task. I, I don't know how well this has been characterized, but yeah, uh, I, I think it's not hard to imagine this to be true. 
So, you know, for example, if I want, if I have a English language model and I want to train it to, uh, you know, generate, all right, uh, process, you know, DNA sequences, the intrinsic dimensionality of that may be basically all of the model's parameters. Maybe that's true for chip design too. And I don't know what the models were there, but, uh, but in that case, yes, maybe you shouldn't expect PEFT to work. Yeah. One last question. Yeah, Nicola. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, uh, the question was for fat goose is how basically how important is it to, to do routing at the token level? Um, I, we don't really know yet, uh, in particular, because we're still underperforming the Oracle baseline where you choose a single model for the for the for a single expert for all decisions at the model. Um, and but our, our our hope or our kind of like philosophy is that if we want to zero shot generalize well, we should be able to use different adapters at different layers because maybe those different adapters represent different, you know, computational steps. Uh, of course, it doesn't actually work yet, so we can't really make that claim. Except that we can analyze. We can actually, yeah, when we have analyzed the actual routing decisions that are made, and it's not just picking one model. You know, it's not picking one model for all tasks. It's not picking one model for a, a, an example. It's it's picking different models for different tokens at different layers. Now it's still working worse than the best possible choice you could make if you had just picked the same model at all the layers. But so whether token level layer level routing is suboptimal and we're shooting ourselves in the foot or not, I don't know. Uh, but uh, but I think philosophically it's most interesting if you allow that to happen. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so if uh, you have more questions, you can catch Paul offline. Yep. Uh, let's thank the speaker. Yep. Thanks for having me.